I'm Ken Robinson and I want to offer my welcome to all of you to the Atlantic Rim Collaboratory in Reykjavik. I was asked to say a few words to introduce this particular session on the importance of creative education. I want to talk a bit about parents. I am a parent. How many of you are parents? How many of you have got parents or have parents? See, so it's a very common, it's a very common thing. Uh, I had parents myself. Uh, there's a big difference, isn't it, between learning and education, and there's a paradox here as well, which is that kids love to learn, but they don't all like being educated. Uh, for a lot of them, the problems start when they go to school. But creativity is not a synonym for the arts. Uh, creativity ranges much more broadly across the whole of the curriculum. Now, I'm not sure I'd be a teacher today, and I definitely wouldn't be the teacher I am today if I hadn't picked up this book, Out of Our Minds, Learning to Be Creative, back when I was in university. I still get goosebumps just holding this thing because it literally changed my life. I think it's important to both distinguish and connect when we start to think about creativity in education. You see, I didn't know education could be different. And I was destined to teach the way that I had been taught. But thanks to Sir Ken Robinson, now me and millions of other educators around the world have the belief and confidence that teaching and learning can be different. The three terms are imagination, creativity, and innovation. The task of education is not to teach subjects, it's to teach students. And ever since I read that quote, I stopped being a geography teacher and started to be a teacher of students and that's influenced my work ever since. So if we're interested to cultivate creative, we have to begin by stimulating and creating conditions for stimulating our natural powers of imagination. He challenged us. He asked us to imagine what would learning look like if we uh, gave well-being a first seat. So when we come to think about creativity in schools, it's for everybody and it's everything. It's the whole curriculum and everybody in the school. It's not just for a few people that we identify with particular talents. Gens Robinson's talk 14 years ago, How School Kills Creativity, opened my eyes and helped me to become a better teacher and to foster uh, creative spaces and to go beyond the classroom. Imagination is the wellspring of creativity. I'm Andy Hargreaves and I'm here with uh, Trista Holwick. Uh, we work together on two major projects and I am the director of Shanine, Change, Engagement and Innovation in Education at the University of Ottawa in Canada. I've known Ken on and off for a long time, probably 20, 30 years. You'll recognize we both have British accents, we both come from the marginalized uh, north of England, him from Liverpool, me from a tiny mill town called Accrington. We both grew up in a working class families. We both understand uh, what it means to be disadvantaged, to struggle against uh, the odds. Uh, we both went into teaching. Uh, we uh, both really care about the creative, innovative aspects of teaching and learning, the things that bring uh, teachers into uh, teaching. And uh, I've also supported uh, what Ken stands for over the years in terms of how he values teachers, how he values the teaching profession and how he has uh, teachers back. And in a few minutes, we'll talk a bit more about how this comes into system change. But I know that Ken's been very important for Trista too, uh, not just as a, an academic now, but, but also as a teacher herself. Yeah, thanks, Andy. Uh, I've, I've only had the opportunity to meet Ken once in person, but his books inspired me long before in the early days as I started my teaching career. Um, that reminder to think about the students and think about creativity and take risks. And that is really the essence of, um, of the learnings I had with uh, Ken Robinson's work. And as I continued in my teaching career, um, I was able to recognize 
the importance of those words even more as I saw the impact on the students. Um, why were students engaged? Where were the arts? Where was the creativity in classes in the schools? And he really gave me as a teacher permission to push a little bit against some of the ways that we were learning and teaching um, in my system, and also to support colleagues as we continue to find innovative and creative ways um, to bring in the physical and the artistic and the creative into our classrooms. And uh, it, it has been a real um, opportunity and inspiration when he came to Ottawa to speak to the Ontario teachers, uh, to see him in action and have a chance to, to learn a little bit more. And I've always remembered that no matter when I reach out to, um, to Sir Ken Robinson, he was available to mentor students and to give advice. And so he's always approachable, even though sometimes it felt like he's someone so far away, so. <laughs> Yeah, Ken, Ken, over the years, he and I uh, uh, connected personally around sometimes we find ourselves on the same speakers platform, we go to dinner together, we obviously read each other's books, we wrote forwards, uh, did endorsements uh, for, for each other's books. Uh, we, th this was the kind of way that, that we connected around the same agenda and the same values over a long period of time. But this took a a, a big step forward uh, about seven or eight years ago when I was trying uh, with a colleague Ingvar Lindvig from Norway to really broaden out the goals of humanistic principles in education, including creativity, but also uh, well-being, uh, equity, inclusion, democracy, human rights, and to try and gather together a group of national leaders, national ministers of education, provincial leaders in Canada, state leaders in the US who cared about these things too and wanted to meet together, to learn from each other, to coach each other, to advance them, to work in partnership with teachers, with professional associations in moving these things forward. But Ingvar and I had, had no money, we had no foundations, we had no tech companies, we had no big oil or anything behind us to get this thing going. What, what we needed was, was people who the world valued and respected to put their name behind it. And so our idea was that we'd have a group of uh, thought leaders who would give their time for free uh, for nothing at all to work with this group and to meet with them and to stimulate and expand their thinking and buttress their values educationally, morally, for children all over the world. And the first person to commit to this on a wing and a prayer uh, for nothing uh, was Ken. And once we had Ken, it's a bit like pyramid selling. It, it, it then became so much easier to persuade everybody else that, that this was a worthwhile thing to do. And over all the course of his remaining years, Ken was extremely generous in his time. He, he uh, joined our session face to face in California with leaders from all over the world who were just awestruck by what he could do with them, not just as a presenter, but in one-to-one -one and, and, and small group conversations. Ken's no longer with us now, but ARC still is. And, and it has a significant impact in the world in bringing about system change. Through COVID and through the pandemic, we've been meeting every six to eight weeks. People have changed their policies. They've turned away from testing. They've introduced uh, outdoor learning for children, outdoor learning spaces in every elementary school uh, within the system. They've gone into makerspace, hands-on uh, education, thinking about more manufacturing coming closer to home after we've been experiencing global supply chains. And part of Ken's legacy is, is part of that system change. And we'll always be grateful to him for that. And part of the imagine if um, process that we're going through right now is imagining how we can take this learning and take uh, Sir Ken's call for action even further. And um, the work in, that we're doing in ARC, we're seeing this happen and we're still buoyed by these ideas and working really hard to make a difference in the lives of children um, and youth across the globe and to bring innovative practices into the hands of teachers and learn with and from the teachers that 
are doing this incredible work. And we are so excited because I think if Ken was here right now, he'd be the biggest champion of our new initiative, uh, working with the Lego Foundation to create a Canadian Playful Schools Network where we're really gonna start to understand and learn from educators who have been doing this work in classrooms, who are thinking about what does it mean to do learning through play? Um, thinking about it in different playful modalities. So the green that Andy was talking about of outdoor learning, but also you know thinking about digital spaces and how we can connect students um, and build their dynamic uh, understanding of, of the multiple modalities that are, they're working with right now and the creativity of coding and um, playful digital tools um, and also machine that idea of making and tinkering and uh, exploring we're really excited to be building on the work that he really inspired for so many of us um, and we know that those that work is going to continue to be referenced and to be a, a driving component of our play, playful schools network um, which is also part of a global playful schools network so the, the movement is happening imagine if is out there but we're really working hard um, here to try to continue to keep his ideas um, and and his spirit in the in the lives of students and teachers. And so we want to take a moment to thank Sir Ken for all he has given us personally and professionally and the inspiration for the work that we're doing now. Um, and it's such an honor to be able to speak uh, to this event uh, in, in memory of all of his ideas and his work. Um, it's a privilege to be here and we really, really thank you for the opportunity. <laughs>